Obi-Wan Kenobi, Part 6. Right. Yes. It's over a week. And I didn't post the review for the last Kenobi episode. Everybody's away to the concerts right now. And I've just been called into work three to four hours early almost every day. And by the time I'm out, I'm exhausted. It starts off with, um, on Tatooine, your high Inquisitor woman uh, is trying to find Luke Skywalker because she wants to kill him. I think it's her way of getting back at Darth Vader, you know, because he killed like her younglings and all. And she goes to this stall, and the guy that was an ass to Kenobi, and one of the other guys at the first episode is there, and she quickly puts him in his place for being an ass. And she demands to know if uh, <coughs> the stall attendant knows an Owen, <coughs> as in Owen Lars, <coughs> Luke Skywalker's uncle, and Luke Skywalker's stepbrother. And then I think he most likely denies it, and then he goes and warns Owen that there's this uh, woman looks dangerous, uh, can use the force, is after him and Luke. So they basically barricade their home in Tatooine and prepare themselves for her coming down. They tell little Luke Skywalker that uh, the Tusken Raiders are up to those shenanigans again and they're going to come down here, when the real reason is that there's a psychopathic woman out to kill him. <coughs> Hardly going to tell a child the real reason. So she comes down and she basically... Uh, Owen Lars, I will tell you this, friggin' brave uh, attempting to take her down. You know, she's got a friggin' lightsaber, she can use the force, and he has like a blaster, like a rifle, like brave. I really like how they show the side of Owen Lars where he's just uh, texting no shit. You know, he's not too far away from the Owen that we see in A New Hope. You know, he really is just, i <sighs> had enough. You know, he's done with everything, he just wants to live his life in peace on the farm and raise Luke like he was a son. And I really love that they got the same actor from the prequels back to reprise the role. <coughs> so she goes in, kicks Owen Lars' ass, and then Luke is forced to skip through like a hatch out into the, um, the canyons to get away from her because there's nowhere else for him to go. Even though he's out in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's, at least he'll have a chance of like losing her and maybe she'll give up. So this episode here picks up where the previous one ended and friggin' uh, Kenobi's on the ship with all these other people and he agrees to jump on another ship and fly solo because he knows that Vader will follow him and it's basically just to get uh, the Empire off the backs of these other civilians on that ship and go after Kenobi uh, because Kenobi is just after him and he doesn't want to endanger Princess Leia and the rest of the bastards that are on the ship. So uh, they arrive at this planet, and I was thinking, is that Mustafar or Mustafar? Because it looked quite like it, but I was thinking, nah, it couldn't be, couldn't be. And basically, this is the rematch that Kenobi and Darth Vader are going to have. And they do have some nods and references to the prequels. It's more like, um, Kenobi says something like, oh, I will do what I must. And Vader says, then you will die. Instead of saying, you will try to eat it in the prequels. And I, I wouldn't call this the rematch of the century. It definitely was a fun, entertaining fight to watch. You know, and Kenobi now has, you know, his strength back. And he's using the Force and all these. I really like the part where he lifts all the rocks. All the rocks, the boulders behind him. And just smashes them into Vader's suit. And Vader's just like backing into a corner. And he's just like, you know, ow, 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 ow. Well, he doesn't do that. Doesn't, I don't think he says it either. But, you know, he may as well have. <clears throat> they really should have played some of the prequel music for that fight scene, but it was alright for what it was. Um, Vader also like, has kind of be buried underneath a large amount of rubble, and he's like trying to use all of his strength to get the rubble off him so he can go take down Vader again. And I thought, oh, this is probably the moment that um, Qui Gon Jinn shows up. You know, the same way that whenever Rey was lying on her back, all the Force ghosts from the prequels reached out to her. Um, but no, that didn't happen. Kenobi uh, engages with Vader. He, get, he gets the rubble off and then he engages with Vader again, tries to surprise attack him, and uh, friggin' ends up like with the lightsaber breaking off a piece of Vader's helmet where you can see Anakin Skywalker's face hitting Christensen 
we all knew that moment was coming. Why else would they bring Hayden Christensen back apart from the flashbacks? And it's at that moment kind of we realise that Anakin Skywalker is in fact Darth Vader. I'm pretty sure he knew the entire time that they only thought Anakin Skywalker was dead. But he, he actually freaking tears up. He tears up when he sees, you know, his old friend, his old apprentice is in this suit. And he basically did this to him, you know, because whenever they fought in Mustafar or Mustafar, Kenobi cut off Anakin's arms and legs, even though Anakin was being an outright dick and deserved it. Kenobi, you know, is empathetic and still feels bad because he doesn't just see Darth Vader, he just sees his old friend Anakin Skywalker. And this entire time for the last 10 years, Kenobi has been beating himself up because he felt responsible. He felt that he was the reason that uh, Anakin Skywalker turned to the dark side. And I like that there was a tiny bit of humanity left in Anakin there, where he basically says to Obi-Wan, I am not your failure. And that, you know, you didn't kill Anakin Skywalker, I did, as if Darth Vader did. Which was amazing, you know, to see that. At least, you know, I never thought, you know, Anakin Darth Vader would actually give Kenobi that, you know, closure that, no, you didn't do this, I did. You know, and Kenobi's just like, oh my god, my friend has actually gone. Um, whenever he says, um, the same way, I'm going to destroy you. <coughs> so Kenobi, I think, I think at that moment, he, he, he tries one last time to get Anakin to turn back to the light. <laughs> but whenever Darth Vader just takes over, it, it's just Kenobi realizes, okay, there's nothing I can do. This is, it's been 10 years, you think, you know, things should have changed. Nope, he's worse. Because the mask is damaged, you can hear Hayden Christensen and you can hear James Earl Jones speaking. At the same time, it flips back and forth where you hear Anakin talking and then you hear Darth Vader to show, I think it's to represent the conflict between Anakin and Darth Vader. You know, he doesn't necessarily like what he's doing. He wants to come back, but he's just, he's so angry and bitter over what happened in the past. It's just, it's it's stronger, you know, and he's just, and Kenobi realises there and then there's nothing he can do. At this point, as we see later on in the Ocean Trilogy, it's Luke Skywalker that can only bring him back from the light bring him back to the light. Kenobi's like, you know, okay, nothing I can do here. Thanks for the closure. I'm done with you. And just walks away. And Darth Vader is injured because Kenobi basically kicked his ass and couldn't bring it to himself to kill him. And it's not really the Jedi way to kill, you know, your opponent when they're down or unarmed. So the High Inquisitor woman is uh, still chasing Luke Skywalker through the canyon. She's found him and just like Using the, I think she uses the force to knock him down, you know, a hill, and he falls into unconsciousness. And at this point, Kenobi is able to sense that Luke is in trouble in Tatooine, and he just flies over down to get him. And Han goes there, basically goes up to Luke, and she's literally about to strike him. She's going to kill him. And Kenobi arrives in Tatooine, and finds Owen and his wife, I forget her name, and they set out to look for Luke, only for the High Inquisitor to show up carrying little Luke Skywalker in her arms, tears in her eyes, saying that, you know, she couldn't bring herself to kill him. You know, and then she's like, you know, is she as bad as Darth Vader as Anakin Skywalker was? And Kenobi's just like, no, um, it's just not. <laughs> and that's the difference between the High Inquisitor and Darth Vader. She couldn't bring herself to kill a child. You know, like, why would you do that there? You know, if you witnessed, if you were a child and you witnessed, your friends who were also kids being murdered in front of you, why would you want to become the very thing that, you know, destroyed your life? <laughs> but then again, she wanted revenge on you, she wanted to kill him, so she was going to kill Luke Skywalker uh, to get back at him, I think. But then that would mean she was just as bad as him. So, she, Kenobi helps her come to the realization that she's done a good thing here. And then they part ways. So, I wonder will she show up in season two, or <clears throat> in a future film? Because like, she was an interesting character. You know, something might have happened to her. You know, she's not going to just disappear like that. There, or maybe she just goes into exile and lives a new life. The reason my eyes are closed is because I'm trying to stay awake. But I wanted to get this vlog done for anybody to watch, you know? And then it, it goes, um, Princess Leia is now safe. She's back in Alderaan and she's with Bail Organa and his woman. Um, she had, can only give her like a holster with no blaster in it, you know, just to have, I think, as a keepsake. And that she'll use it one day, and blah. And then it shows that I was thinking to myself, you know, I remembered, you know, Kenobi was reaching out to Qui Gon Jinn, <coughs> Liam Neeson, you know, throughout the majority of the season. I was thinking he's gonna have to show up now. He's gonna have to show up. Uh, they can't just you know ignore that though. They can't just leave it for season three. And lo and behold, there he is. He shows up as a Force ghost, as a Force ghost. 
and he's just like, yeah, you know, oh, you just couldn't see me, you weren't ready to see me yet. I've been here this whole time. Which, when you watch the interviews, as well as you, you would come to think, is Qui Gon Jinn still around Kenobi? You know, in A New Hope. And most likely he is. He's probably with him whenever Vader killed him. Uh, same way Kenobi and Vader were probably with Luke. Uh, during their friendly competition, they were during the Jedi. Um, we were all waiting for Kenobi's iconic line from the prequels. And they used it at the right opportunity. Um, whenever... Owen is still not happy with Kenobi and doesn't want Luke to be involved in the Jedi in any way because of you know having his father, and but I think because uh, Kenobi came down to rescue Luke, you know he kind of proved himself, and Owen's like you know, do you want to meet Luke? Do you want to meet him? You know he begins to show a bit more respect for him, and Kenobi goes over to little Luke Skywalker and he just says to him, "Hello there." You know, doesn't say it the way that in the prequels, but basically just says a little bit, and that's obviously fan service, fucking not to the prequels, which is brilliant. I love it. And they, yes, that was meant to be. They used it at the right time, the right moment. Love it. And then the episode ends. I think uh, season two will probably be, you know, who's going to be the main villain of that there? Probably Darth Maul. You know, season one I think was originally meant to be Darth Maul, but then I decided to go in favour of Darth Vader. Um, so I'd say season two could be all about Darth Maul, find out about Luke Skywalker and trying to kill him, and then Kenobi will just, you know, finish him there and then. That's it to do season two. Like I said, all I wanted to say, as you can see, I'm still going to keep my eyes open. Goodbye.